China's trade war with Australia is affecting a growing number of industries, including the wine industry. Tony Badalin is CEO of Australian Grape and Wine, the National Association of Australia's Wine Grape and Wine Producers, responsible for policy, trade and business outcomes for the entire industry. Tony, thanks for joining us. Oh, pleasure to be here. What's the latest on China's restrictions on Australian wine and what are the known timelines in the anti-dumping case? So uh, I think it's important to understand that we actually have two cases and two sets of tariffs that have been imposed in Australia. So in the anti-dumping case, we've got a tariff that ranges between 107% to 212% that's been imposed. It's an interim tariff. Uh, the timeline for that interim tariff is four to nine months. So there's a possibility extended. And in, during that time, there'll be the conversion into a permanent measure. So uh, w given what's happened so far, we expect that to be silver. The other one is the countervailing duties case that last week was announced of a 6.3 to 6.4% import duty. And again, it has the same timeline of six to nine months with the, with the same caveat that we'll probably get a permanent duty imposed in that time. Mm. And those permanent duties, they last for five years. Wow. A long time, isn't it? And a bit of a, uh, a headache. But, you know, normally I'd say a glass of red might fix it up, but not in this case. What are our main markets for Australian wine, the share of those exports to those markets and where China sits? So China is our largest export market by far. It has 40 percent of our exports. It's about one point two billion dollars. Uh, then we have the United States, and the United Kingdom. They're both about the same and they're about about half a billion dollar mark. And then you have Canada, again, another significant market. And then we, we export to another, you know, 160 odd countries. So, but they're, they're the big the big four, uh, and they're the ones where we're most exposed and where the most of the, the growth opportunities, in fact, are like. Chinese are making some nice wines too, aren't they? They've, they've nicked all the uh, great winemakers from around the world. And um, what are they about? I think I heard somewhere where they're the second largest uh, wine exporter or in the world and they would be the biggest in a couple of years time. So um, we need to get our winemakers back, first of all, uh, and, make, <laughs> and make those delicious wines here. Yeah, I don't think uh, there are some certainly some very, very good wines in China. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very difficult place to go grapes, though, and make good wine. So their best region is a place called Ningxia. And it's so cold that they have to bury the vines in winter so they don't die. So that becomes very expensive and it makes good wine, but it's, uh, it's not economic in the, the usual sense of the word. Having grown up on the land and uh, surrounded by grapes, the, the nice thing about burying the, uh, those, uh, the vines is that you wouldn't have to prune them because they're, I mean, they're, they're, it's the worst job God ever created. I think you, you must agree on that one. Oh, I think there's no doubt that winter pruning is a, is a job not for the faint-hearted and one that you want to give away as much as you can. You know, has all the uh, wine exporter to China had duties imposed, including uh, the more expensive brands like Penfolds and such? So the duties are imposed on all wines, all still wines, in bottles under two litres. So all those 750 mil bottles uh, which go, and 98% of our exports to China are red wine. And so every one of that bottled wine is now subject to those import duties. Doesn't matter what the price point is. That's a big chunk out of the wine industry, isn't it? Yeah, and it's essentially made the, the market unviable. So the last fortnight, there have been no shipments that have gone into, or virtually no shipments that have left our ports and headed to China. Mm. And it's going to be like that for four years or five years. Will the wine just sit there until it can be sold with higher duties imposed, or can some of it be diverted to other markets? Yeah, so a lot of the wine it will now be looking for other homes. Uh, the problem is, of course, it's very hard to build a market from scratch. And while we're in many markets, uh, you've got to build your brand value and your brand cachet. So that takes time. So unfortunately, uh, it's going to be a slow process. Hopefully, the domestic market will do their bit. And we're encouraging everyone to buy Australian this year and, and see if we can take some of that slack. I recall years ago when we were uh, doing some uh, work in New York, one of my favourite wines is uh, Ninth Island, the, uh, uh, the uh, Pinot variety, of course. And I could actually buy a bottle of uh, Ninth Island Pinot in New York cheaper than I could in Australia, which was quite a surprise. But at that stage, I wasn't complaining at all. No, and 
a lot of the, the differences in prices come down to taxes. So we're a very heavily taxed country for alcohol. So, you know, wine, when you put all the taxes on top of each other, about 46% of your bottle. So, you know, that, that's a lot of money that's going to the government. And, and that means that, you know, in the export markets, you're not paying all those prohibitive taxes. Have you suggested to government, I'm, I'm sure they'll be tickled pink to hear it, but if there's a, uh, if you've been smashed by the, uh, the Chinese tariffs and uh, the, the trade war with Australia, perhaps the government could in some way alleviate some of the taxes. So therefore the, uh, the damage or the hurt isn't as great. Yeah, we've made a lot of suggestions to government. Uh, that is one of them, that we should have tax relief, uh, certainly in the, um, the medium term for the next couple of years while we can diversify our markets. And we're also looking for the government to work with us on that long-term market diversification strategy. So that's going to be, you know, we want a, a 10-year program, and mm. not just for wine, but for all those products that are suffering in China. Let, let's work to get them into other markets, get down the bar barriers and just getting that market onto the shelves. Do you think the Chinese market was, um, you know, the old saying, don't put too many eggs, or in our case, bottles of wine in that one basket? Yeah, it, you're absolutely right. We've been cautioning people about their exposure to China, but you can't blame people for following the money. And the consumer in China loves our product, so they buy more of it than anyone else, and they pay a higher value than anyone else. So it's a, a highest price point market. So naturally, people are following the profits. And, you know, it's been the political situation that has turned that round, unfortunately. And this just, just doesn't hit the wine growers and the, um, the, uh, the industry itself. It hits also the peripheral industries, those that rely on providing goods and services to output that bottle of wine. Oh, absolutely. And regional economies, there's so much of mm. regional Australia that relies on the wine sector, the grape growing and the winemaking. But you're right, the people who make posts, the people who put posts in the ground, the people who supply, and there's a lot of suppliers. About 46,000 jobs in Australia are associated with the wine sector, mm. the grape and wine sector. So, so it's an important industry. And the other thing that really worries me is that the mental health aspect of this, this latest knock after a year of bushfires and COVID mm. where industry is suffering. There's, there's a lot of people out there who are who are a very you know bad state of mind and we really need to look after them. Recall when I grew up, I mean, this is sort of like, oh, the days going by. I sa I'm sounding like my father actually, which I always cringed, but when, you know, when I grew up, and I grew up in Mildura in Victoria, which is for those out of uh, our, our market, you know, it's, it's in Australia. But the, um, I recall having to pick the grapes and one, I hated that because there were spiders and, and uh, all sorts of uglies under those uh, vines. Now they have machines, but the thing that really you know, came home to me was that how all these 20 acre blocks in those days, and they're probably been swallowed, but there's still a lot of those around. Uh, it's, but I used to find that these little blocks of 20 acres and 25 acres run, run by the Italians, they had two things. One was to die for, that was the home-baked bread in the kiln outside, was stunning, this Italian bread. And the other, not to die for, but almost killed you, was the stuff they used to clean the tractor with and drink it. It was called grappa. So, I mean, there's a lot of memories there and we need to sort of hold on to um, the, the, the romance and the, uh, the, the goodness of the, the, of the wine industry, don't we? Oh, yeah. And these areas are still just as good as they used to be. So, yeah, you know, I love going to the areas with that strong Italian heritage. Mm. My name's Italian. And, and, you know, you go there and you go to Griffith in the Riverina when it's uh, salami making time. Oh, uh, stunning. And there's no, no better time. No better time. But the grappa, I mean, clean, clean the tractor, which is a Massey Ferguson in those days, clean the tractor and then they drank it. It was yeah. pretty wild. I mean, my first, when I stuck out one day, I was 15, here's a, here's a thing, 15 and at some, uh, some fair at the, at the school. And uh, someone got hold of this bottle of grappa. So I thought, oh, I'm, I'm going to have a mouthful of this stuff. And it almost turned me off drinking you know, forever. It's the strongest drink. Do you drink grappa? Oh, absolutely not. I'm going nowhere near <laughs> grappa. Look, I admire people who do. I respect them. Their courage, it's, it's clear. Uh, but it's it's... Yeah, it would not only cleans tractors, it cleans everything, I think. Yeah, yeah. and the, it just rot away the stomach. Uh, what do you estimate to be the total cost to the industry, including suppliers and associated employment? Oh, look, we, we, we haven't actually got the final mm. uh, analysis on that. It, it's potentially very, very large. And the thing about this is it's not just the short term, but this is uh, going to be a cost for several years. 
uh, as we try and diversify markets. So it's something that I think will probably be larger impact next vintage. I think this vintage people have, you know, they, they've got, we've had poor vintages for the last three years. We'll have an above average one this year. Mm. So there'll be wine back in tanks, storage down. So I think uh, it's going to get worse next year, but uh, the cost will be, will be great there will be people who will go out of business, there's mm. no doubt. A lot of us said the, um, uh, this, this, uh, the Chinese uh, tariffs and wine and uh, their trade war, you know, inverted commas there, uh, against Australia's part to blame because of the, uh, the uh, new trade deal that China had with uh, the US prior to COVID. And they had to make some sort of wriggle room to be able to um, adhere to those conditions for that uh, deal with, uh, with the US and Trump and the Trump administration. Is there a, a part of that you think that they've said we ha- actually have to uh, make some, some wriggle room here to uh, keep to our part of the deal with the, uh, with the Americans? Or is it just, you know, just being pig-headed? I think it's more the latter. I think the, I think there has been tensions created mm. because of the the us in the international sphere with china but i don't think we can blame that deal on this that there's there's other other factors at play here and 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 clearly the relationship with china is extremely poor and all the press has shown that it's not going to get any better anytime soon and we are clearly being made an example of it's a tricky one isn't it yes you know, some of some of the pundits are saying be a little more tolerant and others are saying no we have to you know stand up for our, for our own sovereignty here what do you think do you think there should be a, an in-between of that or do you think that the government's on the on the only track it's not the uh it really hasn't got a whole lot of choice so is it can we can we do something different than we're doing right now or is it just the way it is and we have to accept it i think We've reached the stage where we are at a point where there's no going back. Mm-hmm. So I think now we do have our sovereignty, which we have to we yeah. have to support, and there's no doubt about that. I think that we have been caught in the crossfire, the economic crossfire. Uh, we will go through all the, the legal channels that we can, uh, both within China and also if we go to the World Trade Organization, like so. We'll 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 keep pursuing this. We don't think we've got a case to answer, but I don't. I think there's very little the government can now do because they, there's no dialogue. Uh, the Chinese ministers refuse to meet with our politicians and that makes it extremely difficult to actually come to a solution. And their lone wolf approach, you know, let's, let's throw, out, throw out an insult here and there and everywhere, that doesn't help much either. Uh, who benefits most from the, uh, this Chinese action? Well, I don't think, uh, well, the people who, the only people who will benefit and the Chinese consumer won't benefit and the Chinese industries that rely on our exports won't benefit. So so there's pain in China as well coming from this. So the, the people who will benefit will be some of our competitors, people like Chile, people like Spain, uh, people like Italy who export to China and can increase to fill the gap that we had. So I, I would think that they're going to be the biggest beneficiaries, but they don't wish to benefit at our expense. I've had a lot of calls of support from people in these countries, our you know competitors, if you like, who are also good friends who, are, who, who don't want to benefit, but of course they will take mm. advantage. What do you expect to happen at the end of the anti-dumping process? Look, given the evidence that we've seen that's been provided for the interim duties, uh, there's been no basis for that. But what we it looks like is that what will come down at the end is something very similar to where we are now. So a permanent duty in that 200% range. Uh, and we will think it'll be challengeable, but of course, Challenging in WTO takes you three to four years. Dumping duties are put on for four or five years. So it's not going to make much benefit. So I, I don't think unless the political situation improves that we'll get a good result, even though there's no evidence to mm. support the fact that we are, we are hurting their industry. Producers can pivot to other markets, and you know, which can take time. Which ones, though, do you think, if we have the, uh, the, the, you know, have time to do this, which ones do you think are likely to be more responsive to our requests? So initially, obviously, the domestic market springs to mind. This 20% of our domestic market is imports. And so we're hoping people will buy Australian. But that, of course, is not a, a long sustainable solution. So we need the United Kingdom with a Brexit, which is looking increasingly difficult. There will be people who prefer to buy Australian rather than European. It will be easier to access. Mm-hmm. And of course, uh, United States and Canada are both big markets that were underweighted. But I think 
really we have to have a long-term strategy that looks more into Asia, more into India, and even places like East Africa and Russia where uh, are very difficult markets now. But we need to plan for five to 10 years because mm. we're going to be in this for that long. What about getting wine into uh, North America? Uh, what would the the time frame be you know, and getting larger and larger amounts. Now there's there's some good Australian wines around the states, but um, you know, you're still swamped by um, you know, California wines and Washington State wines and stuff like that. So, is there is that a, a practical option or or whimsical thinking? It's uh, we've put a lot of effort in the the market in the United States for the last three years, and it's proving very tough. And because there's very good local wine. And of course, domestic wine has a very good cachet. So it's proving very difficult to get into the three tier distribution system, but we will redouble our efforts. Uh, people do like our wine there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is good value. It is good quality. Um, so uh, we, we've we been higher before. So we've been up to the billion dollars in before the GFC mm-hmm. in the US. So, so we can come back. So yeah, expect to see a lot more wine uh, on the shelves. Let's rewind a bit and uh, go to the actual growers, those that, you know, they're the ones that, that are starting the process of a, of a great bottle of wine. Are they feeling, though, that, you know, this is just getting a bit much for them because it's a hard, hard life on the land? Yeah, no, it is really tough for, for growers in particular. And we're going into our next vintage, you know, coming up in, well, some people start picking in late December, but, you know, January, February, March are peak times. And there's a lot of concerns about, you know, will people want my grapes and what are the prices going to be? And all indications are prices will be, you know, lower because obviously demand is not going to be there without China. So there's pressure on prices. Um, and it's it's and as I say, with the mental health aspect, we've had a couple of tough vintages. We had a record low vintage mm. last year and, and these guys are in pain. And if you haven't got a good contract and dealing with, a you know, a winemaker, you've got a relationship, it, it could be really tough. So I... I I'm really concerned about a lot of our growers. What about bright spots? Any bright spots for the Australian wine industry? I know over Christmas that we'll be consuming probably far too much and that our liver will you know, get a fair beating uh, or battering. But um, what are the bright spots? Because once Christmas is gone, then you're back to you know, post or still during COVID and COVID does uh, put restrictions on how we, how we exist but at the moment. I think there's a lot of bright spots so we're we're in the state where um, we believe we can diversify our markets. It will take time. We also believe that we'll get a good hit domestically as people have sympathy with us. So um, I think we're, there's never been our product has never been better, and we'll have a better vintage this year. And stocks are down, so it's never been a better time to have a crisis like this. The only thing is this year's been crisis after crisis, and it's just been really tough. So, um, but we're a resilient bunch, mm. and you'll see us come through it. Have a great Christmas, great talking with you. We must do this more often. Um, uh, hope the headache isn't too bad for you after Christmas Day. That's what Boxing Day is all about. You sit there whinging about how sore the head is, but we have cricket, so what more? What, we're, we're living the dream, aren't we? Oh, we are. Look, we've had some tough times, but we'll get through it. And yeah, have a drink, watch the cricket, and you know, hope Santa brings you something nice. Thank you very much. Thank you.